Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. And today I have some of that cool stuff because I'm talking here with Kat Brzezowski. Kat is a senior editor at Swoon Reads, which is an imprint of Macmillan, and she's written some great segments about fiction writing for the podcast before, like how to craft a strong voice, how to write great dialogue, and how to write dual points of view. So I thought in honor of National Novel Writing Month, it'd be fun to bring her on the show this year to talk about the -the behind-the-scenes activities at a publishing house, like the different types of editing that can happen and how how ready a book really needs to be to be acquired. Thanks for being here today, Kat. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. So first, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about the company you work for, Swoon Reads? Yeah, so what I love about Swoon Reads is it's a place where people can upload their YA manuscript, and we choose manuscripts to publish based on the feedback from other readers and writers on our site. So anyone can go on and make an account and start reading right away for free, and there's hundreds of manuscripts you can read across all genres of YA, from romance to mystery to horror to thrillers. Um, There's really something for everybody. And we pick the best ones to publish based on what the readers on the site love and what people uh, at our company love as well. And we publish them usually in hardcover, and they're published. Published, um, like another Macmillan book, but with the added bonus of having real readers chiming in and saying what they love. So oh, it's it has a lot of uh, user participation, which we adore, and we get to find out what readers like about the book, and we even use that as part of our editorial process. Oh, that's really cool. So is it all YA? It's all YA. It's everything, every kind of YA you could dream up. We have, you know, werewolf books. We have enemies to lovers. We have, you know, great capers, stuff that's really scary. So any genre of YA, we publish it. Okay, and then does anything ever come through agents, or is it all through your website? Everything is submitted to Swoon Reads. Sometimes the author will have an agent um, when they've submitted, but everything comes as a submission through the Swoon Reads website. Okay, and then do um, do the reader comments or upvotes or things like that determine which books you look at or decide to acquire? Definitely. So we take that all into account when we look at books um, to acquire. And we also have readers in-house that will guide us to what they love. We have people reading every day, um, hundreds of manuscripts, you know, over the course of the year and telling us what they love from all different departments. So it could be someone in subsidiary rights. It could be a publicity assistant or a designer also telling us what they love. So we look at all of that and we're really getting input from all sources, people who love YA that work here and people all over the world who read on the site. Oh, neat. I didn't know all that. So how many, about how many books are submitted each year and then about how many do you actually publish? So there, I think at this point, there are about 600 manuscripts on the site, which is great. Um, Might be a a few shy of that, but I think it's around 600. And then we've published a range. I think last year we had um, about 25 come out. Um, So we have a a lot of books coming out every year um, across all genres. And of course, we have authors who we've worked with that came through Soon Reads, but we've acquired their next book, um, you know, Afterwards, So you don't have to put a second or third book on the site. Once you're a Swoon Reads author, it goes through a more traditional acquisition process. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So given that November is National Novel Writing Month, I imagine you see um, a lot of new submissions in December from writers who are excited to have a completed manuscript in hand for the first time. I know I'd be excited if I had that. So is there, is there, is there like a number one problem you see in submissions, the, the one thing that keeps a lot of writers from making it to the next step? Yeah, one thing I see a lot in submissions that I wouldn't say is a problem. One thing that I love about our site is we take things that need, you know, sometimes some editorial love, sometimes a lot of editorial love and really pour that time into it. But one thing I notice when I start reading is a lot of times you're told a lot about the character up front. So I always look for books where they were really diving into action and the character is really wanting something from page one and you're able to learn about them through what they want and how they're going to get it. So really establishing that sense of agency and personal motivation rather than books that sort of start with, you know, telling a lot about who the character is. So that's one thing. Um, I think also there are books where there's great characters, great voice, and great dialogue, but not a lot happens. So we always look for something where there's also a great plot. But again, that's something that we work with our writers on. So we have a lot of flexibility to fall in love with one thing about a manuscript and then really be able to bring the other elements up to that level. Okay. And how I'm wondering how does an author know when when a book is ready to submit. You know, you've got this manuscript in hand and you've been working on it so long, sometimes it's hard to see yourself and even maybe your close friends and your mom loves it. But, but how do you really know when it's ready? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think for me, I always think as a writer, you should ask, like, is there anything more that you know to do with it? And have you kind of put it away for a while and come back at it, you know, with a new sense of what it could be? But one thing I also love about our site is that we've had people submit things, get a lot of feedback from readers because readers can leave comments both in the manuscript, sort of in line and also as comments, and then resubmit and have their revised version get published by Swoon. So that's one thing I love is it's a way to sort of have a critique group, um, you know, anywhere virtually, and people become really close and have their own sort of offshoot critique groups as well. But I think when you sort of reach the point where you're just changing a word here or there or revising to revise, it's time to to let it go and let our readers fall in love with it. Can you revise the manuscript once you've uploaded it, say you find a typo or something, or do you have to submit an entirely new manuscript? And then when you do, is it connected to that old one in some way? You have to submit an entirely new manuscript, and it's a new entry. Like, it's essentially a new manuscript, but we know our manuscripts so well um, on our site, and we spend so much time that we always know, like, oh, this book is back, and we we really loved it. And sometimes those will be sort of at the top of our our list to look at. Um, And things like typos and, you know, grammatical errors, those happen all the time, and that's not something that would keep us from taking a book on. Um, I think those are really easy to spot and kind of fun. I mean, I'm sure you hear from people who get published books and think, like, how could there ever be a typo in here? So it happens even in published books. So that's not something we really worry about. But yeah, you can always, um, you know, take the manuscript down and put up a revised version. We've had people where the one that got selected was the third, fourth, fifth manuscript they submitted to Swoon Reads, and they just had to find that perfect story. Nice. And how do typos get into published books? I kind of know because I know there were some typos in my books, but I get asked this question all the time. Like, how, how does that possibly happen? I think it's just, you know, basic human error. I mean, there's always people looking at it. There's copy editors, there's proofreaders, but I think there's stuff that your eye just skips over, um, even if you read it a lot of times. Sometimes it's because the book was done quickly, which is not, you know, usually our preference. So sometimes it'll be, you know, if you produce a book in a couple months, that is more likely to have typos. But sometimes it's just, you know, even if you have three or four sets of eyes on something, you can just skip over certain things and your, you know, your brain kind of fills in the letters and you just end up with typos. But we can always fix them in, in reprints, but... I think, you know, my friends from home who don't really know what I do will be like, I saw a typo. You know, you didn't edit it. I'm like, oh, that's not what my job is, but thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So say you fall. well, Well, actually, let's talk about that for a minute. So, you know, people do think that's your job, but it's not. So what are the different types of editing that happen, um, in a manuscript along the way? What is your job and when does that catching the typos happen? Yeah, so I think of myself when I as more of like a content editor when I describe myself to kind of differentiate from, you know, maybe a copy editor or a proofreader. So what we do is really make the story the best it can be and we pass it on to somebody else to catch all the grammatical errors and and spelling errors. So there's a lot of different types of editing and every editor's process is really different. There's not a uniform way to do it. So the first step I would say most people do is they read the manuscript and they type, type up editorial notes into an editorial letter or they might leave their notes in track changes in Word depending on what their style is. You're looking for big picture things like voice, character, plot, dialogue, things like that that are really big picture. Um, When you've kind of got that sorted out, which can take a round or a few rounds, I love line editing. That's really what my passion is. So going in and really saying, you know, can this sentence be revised? Or, you know, why is this character doing this here? Or looking at things like dialogue tags, a lot of authors want to use things like, you know, exclaimed or laughed or shouted. And, you know, sometimes just a good, he said, she said works just as well. Um, And then sometimes there'll be an additional um, authenticity read if there's a character from a background that the author would like, you know, a perspective of someone from that background, which is something we do a lot of um, at Swoon Reads, try to get another set of eyes on it as well for authenticity. Um, So yeah, there's all the sort of different kinds of editing. And then it gets passed on to somebody who, you know, our production editors hire copy editors and proofreaders, and they do all of the catching of spelling and errors. I mean, I definitely fix them in the manuscript when I see them, but I don't spend a lot of time um, thinking about if the commas are right, since that is not my forte. (laughs) Right. Okay, well, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor, but when we come back, we'll talk about what happens when an editor falls in love with a manuscript on the Swoon Reads platform, some advice Kat has for authors who are dealing with being edited for the first time, and how to come up with that one important sentence to describe your novel. We'll be right back. Today's show is sponsored by Captera. Find great new business software to simplify your work at captera.com slash grammar. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. 
There are more than a million reviews of products from real software users. A million reviews! So you'll find everything you need to make an informed decision. No matter what your business needs, you can find it with Captera. It has all the major grammar checkers, and Captera even has the tool I used to make my iOS game, Grammar Pop. It gives that tool, Game Salad, four stars, and I agree with that. Join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. Visit captera.com slash grammar free today to find the tools to make an informed decision for your business. Captera.com slash grammar. Captera, that's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash grammar. Captera, software selection simplified. I also want to tell you about another podcast you'll love today, The Illusionist. That's Illusionist with an A. It's an award-winning podcast about language hosted by Helen Zaltman. This fall, you can catch The Illusionist in theaters across the U.S. and Canada with their new live show called No Title. No Title digs into the subject of gender in language via medieval werewolves, the superhero Ms. Marvel, and a boring but life-changing incident in a suburban bank. Get tickets now at theillusionist.org slash events. That's illusionist with an A, not an I. They can promise word wizardry, but not actual illusions. That's theillusionist.org slash events. And so you've you've described it a little bit, but say you do fall in love with a a manuscript on your platform, and then you decide to acquire it, and then sort of what happens next? It, does it depend based on what the problems are with the manuscript, or is there more of like a set process? It sort of depends. I mean, a lot of it has to do too with how the author likes to work. Sometimes I'll send big picture notes um, or have a phone call, and then the author will kind of take it from there. Some authors want or need more direction, like more specifics. So a lot of it's based sort of on the author's style. Some people love to work over email. Some people really need to get on the phone to hash things out. Sometimes you can do it in person, which is really rare, but that's a nice gift and always feels really special when it happens, sort of like old-fashioned days of publishing. People used to have long lunches, and things were a little bit more fun. Um, But yeah, I think basically people start with big picture notes because it doesn't really make sense to give line notes on whole chapters that would change. Like I said, I'm a big line editor, so I think I I have to really resist the urge to be fiddling with sentences in scenes that might go away. Um, I also love when my authors have a nice sense of how to fix things themselves. So I would say, you know, this character needs work, um, needs to go in like a different direction. And I love when my authors say, you know, I already know how I'm going to fix that. Um, Some authors are like that and some authors want more specific direction. So I try to tailor it around what the author's strengths are. And also depends if it's their first book or their eighth book, you know, how much direction they're going to want and need and how much they sort of want you to problem solve with them versus kind of go away and fix it themselves. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I've heard some writers struggle with getting significant feedback. You know, the, this character needs to be completely different or that character, we don't actually need him. He needs to go. You know, what advice can you give to authors who, who are maybe are getting this, you know, extreme or not, you know, significant feedback and are kind of struggling with it? I mean, I know they shouldn't take it personally, but, but what else kind of advice can you give to help them get through that part of the process? I always think about wondering, you know, why that change matters to you and really trying to think of it from a more emotional level. We have this a lot with titles, especially in things like book covers. People have an emotional or visceral reaction or attachment, especially to a specific book title. And I think the question is always sort of like, why does that matter to you? And how can that, what you care about, you know, be incorporated in another way in the book? So with things like a big character going away, I think the question is always, you know, why why is that character being in the book important to you? And how can, if the character really does, does need to go away, how can those traits be, you know, infused in another character? Or a lot of times we'll have way too many side characters and we say, what if you sort of combine these eight people into three and they could kind of have more than one personality trait, which is a great, you know, concept for a side character anyway. I also think it's really important to be able to push back politely and respectfully to your editor and explain why something matters to you, why you've made a certain decision. Um, I really like working with authors who I'm able to have that dialogue with. So I think you don't always need to just change things because your editor says to change it. I think you can ask them why and try to provide solutions that can kind of make a happy compromise for everybody. Yeah. Do you have any books you've worked on that you're especially excited about that are coming out soon that you just can't wait to see? 
Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, we have a debut coming from an author named Prerna Pickett that's called If You Only Knew, which I love because people on the site sort of said it was similar to the movie Step Up um, with Channing Tatum, which oh, I love. Yeah. I love that movie. Um, it yeah. has, yeah, it's so great. So it has sort of people, you know, one from one side of the tracks, one from the other. Um, then the the main character is the daughter of a uh, prosecutor who put the other main character away in jail um, for some gang activity. And now that guy is out and he's trying to be on the straight and narrow. But it starts off with him and his friends vandalizing the prosecutor's car. And he has to come back and sort of um, fix the damage. Um, and so it's just really powerful. I think, you know, it's great. It has characters from marginalized backgrounds, which I love. Um, and it just has like a, a really hot kind of graffiti artist guy and this girl who has her own secrets um, as well. So I love that. Um, what was that called again? That's called If You Only Knew by Prerna Pickett. I'll speak briefly about some of the others since I don't know them as well, but I know they're kind of our bigger <laughs> books. Um Okay. We also have one coming out in January called Rogue Princess by B.R. Myers, um, which they sort of compared to a little bit like Cinder by Marissa Meyer that I'm really excited about. That's a great fantasy. And we have a follow-up to a book we did called Beware the Night. Um, the sequel is called Defy the Sun, and that's by Jessica Fleck. And it's really great. It's sort of set in this um, a little bit dystopian kind of fantasy world that's sort of vaguely Mediterranean um, and these two classes of people, one that live above and one that live sort of below. Um, one worships the sun and one worships the night. And this one is really interesting because she wrote the first book in single POV and the second one is in dual POV, which is interesting. So I like when people kind of break format in that way. So all that stuff's going to come out uh, in winter 2020. So between January and March of next year. Oh, neat. And then look, sort of looking forward, um, you know, thinking about what, what's going to show up on your platform, are there any genres that are really hot right now or something that you'd be, you know, a kind of story that you'd be especially excited if it showed up in your inbox? Yeah, we're always looking for stuff that's high concept, so stuff that's really easy to pitch in terms of, you know, saying this is similar to this other project. Um, always great when it has, like, a movie or, or television comparison where you can kind of, like I said, with Step Up, like you can say, you know, this is for people who love Step Up or people who love this show Sirens or whatever it is. Um, that's always great. We're also actively always looking for more books with characters from marginalized backgrounds and by authors from marginalized backgrounds, both of those, um, whether they're own voices or if they're not, I think we would really love to publish more authors from marginalized backgrounds at Swoon, um, and we need to get them submitted to us so that we can publish them. So one author we work with, Claire Kahn, is really wonderful. Her first book, Let's Talk About Love, came out a couple years ago and has an asexual black main character. It's just a wonderful contemporary story, tons of voice. And she had a follow-up which came out um, this summer called If It Makes You Happy that's sort of like the black Gilmore Girls. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love it. It's like all the small town things you need. It has a great um, like love triangle, queer characters, which is wonderful. So we'd love to find more authors that can kind of deliver that wonderful, you know, diverse story. Um, and we'd love to have more of that on our site because that's something we're all really excited about and something that readers really love as well and want more of. This is one thing I've bumped up against. Um, you know, I'll, I'll describe something and I'll compare it to a, a book that's older. Like you just said Gilmore G Girls, which is kind of older, even though it's still people still watch it. And, you know, I'll say something like, oh, it's like this show. And, and someone will go, how about something that wasn't 20 years ago, Mignon? <laughs> you know, like how, <laughs> how important is it to have it be something, you know, that was published in the last couple of years when you're making those comparisons? I think it's sort of different if you're comparing it to a book versus comparing it to a movie or TV show, and also different if you're saying it's like it's like something versus for fans of. So if people say, you know, this is like, I'm going to come up with something really wacky, like Fault in Our Stars meets Star Wars or something. I'm sure somebody has done this. <laughs> um, it sort of works because you're sort of giving a high concept pitch, so you know it's going to be, I guess, cichlet in space. Um, it doesn't work as well if you say, like, this book is for fans of something either really old, like, say, at this point, like a Harry Potter or something really popular, also like Harry Potter, because, you know, the fans of Harry Potter are, you know, every person who knows how to read. So it doesn't really <laughs> limit, you know, in terms of who we think we're going to sell the book to. It doesn't help us determine an audience. But when it's something like a big movie, like something that everybody kind of knows, like, I don't know, Stand By Me or Minority Report or a show like Gilmore Girls or Cheers or something that kind of has that universal, you know, universal acknowledgement of what the sort of the thing is, I think it works as a high concept pitch. Oh, that's great. That's super helpful. Okay. Because I imagine some people would think, well, I want to say it's like Harry Potter because that was a big hit. So I want them to think mine's going to be a big hit, but that really doesn't work because it's too broad. 
Yeah, it's too broad. And I think it also, you know, we love authors who are currently reading YA and who know what's sort of out there in the YA marketplace. So I love when people reference stuff that's more popular. At the same time, you have to reference stuff that we'll have heard of. Um, Although I've talked to people who are like, oh, I've never read um, Lord of the Flies. But when someone compares something to Lord of the Flies, they at least know from the culture, like what that will be like, even without having read it. Mm Mm-hmm. Great. So how do you want people to find you? What's the best way um, if people have follow-up questions or they want to submit a manuscript, how, how, how should people go about doing that? Yeah. So you can visit Swoon Reads. We're at, you know, swoonreads.com. We also have a great Twitter and a great Instagram. And those are both wonderful places if you want to ask questions. Um, We have really active followings there and we're always looking for questions. We also have a wonderful blog on the Swoon Reads site that you can always ask questions in the comments. Um, We do a lot of sort of asking anything posts. We talk a lot about behind the scenes of publishing, everything from um, jacket design. You can actually vote on covers. We put up cover directions and the users get to pick which cover direction they like the best. We sometimes ask for title ideas. Ideas. We had um, a user name one of our books, which is sort of a Buffy the Vampire Slayer book called When Life Gives You Demons. And that was a user's name, which is such a great pun um, that we never would have come up with. So you can participate in that way. So I would say definitely check out our blog. We do a lot of stuff for NaNoWriMo. It's packed with things from our authors, tips, writing prompts. There's a lot of inspiration to kind of keep you going through November. And we hope that come December and throughout the year, we'll be able to see people's manuscripts on our site. We love having new things to read all the time. Wonderful. Thanks so much. That was Kat Brzezowski from Swoon Reads. Thank you very much for having me. 